This episode of the Beancast is brought to you by Methodify by Delvinia. Get real-world customer feedback in hours, not weeks. Schedule your demo and get a free $20 Amazon gift card. Go to methodify.it slash beancast and methodify it today. Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Visit them on the web at recursivesquirrel.com. Episode 600, Follow the Money. July 13th, 2020. It's time for this week's edition of The Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. Facebook's just completed civil rights audit has unsurprisingly turned up a large number of failings. But Facebook's stance in the wake of the report is what has created the most ire. What will the impact of the report ultimately be? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, a look at social's true legal liabilities over politics and hate. Brand commitment to boycotting social. A look back at 600 episodes. Plus, this week's Fair, Fail, Foul. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the co-host of Across the Pond, marketing transformation consultant, Mr. Samuel Mani. Sam, hi. Hey, Bob. It's exciting to be here on this momentous occasion. A momentous occasion. It's always a momentous occasion these days. There's always a big news and a big brouhaha. Now, also with us, we have Vice President, Analyst of uh, Customer Experience at Gartner, Mr. Augie Ray. Augie, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you are staying well and safe in New York, Bob. I am. Uh, It's the safest place to be right now, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) After the many months. (laughs) And finally, we welcome back Partner and Chief Marketing and Brand Officer at GRK, as well as Board Member at Mashburn Enterprises, Mr. Jonathan Sackett. Jonathan, hi. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. I have to tell you, I'm very nervous tonight. So I don't believe you. <laughs> I, I, that's because I'm lying. <laughs> that's probably why. That's probably why. Well, guess what? We have a lot of social media stuff to talk about this week, just like we had a lot of social media stuff to talk about last week. Um, unlike last week, though, I'm not going to pretend that I have time to talk about anything else. We're just talking about Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of them. But we're going to start off with Facebook right now. Facebook's much-anticipated independent audit of their compliance with acceptance, uh, accepted civil rights best practices found that they were lacking. This is no surprise to anybody. What? I know. <laughs> I but. Don't believe you. What was maybe a little bit surprising to people, though, was the company's response in subsequent meetings with civil rights leaders. Uh, It's what stole all the headlines and got everybody irate this week. Augie, what does Facebook's placating stance, and that's pretty much the only way to describe it, they were just placating and not really addressing the issues. Um, What does that placating stance in these talks reveal about both the company and the true effectiveness of the ad boycott going on right now? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm going to first talk a little bit about just briefly about the leadership because it does an awful lot about Facebook leadership. I just, on the one hand, they have been, as you say, just placating. They just sort of cut and paste PR responses, no commitment, no action. They can't, they can't even really feign like they care. Um, at the same time, I just think it is mind-boggling that they continue to fall back on sort of excuses like they're at some young little startup. Uh, Sandberg said, and this is a quote, we have a long way to go. And, I'm, and you know, here you've got billionaire leaders at the fifth largest corporation in the world trying to play as if they're just stumbling this way through it. It's, it's an all shucks routine that just drives me crazy, as you can probably tell. But that's, 
that's not really the question you're asking. And so if we really focus at Facebook's stance and impact, and it, I think it just boils down to this, which is that Facebook will not act because it does not need to act because its users are addicted and advertising revenue is still flowing. And I'm sure it's a it's a sting to their pride that a thousand of the largest advertisers are you know, calling attention to these problems, but there are just so many people behind them, so many small businesses, so many other businesses. And in fact, obviously, if you follow the, the stock, the stock is up more than the Dow in the last month, so the market doesn't care. And so if users don't care because they're not abandoning and the market doesn't care and the leaders don't care, then there's just going to be very little reason or impetus for change. And so what, what I just say is this, is that I really think that this works out in one of three ways. The most likely is that Facebook will throw a few bones to advertisers, maybe a little more transparency, a little more tracking, something along those lines, and everyone comes back. Um, you know, there's certainly a remote chance that users could begin to to to, to cause some change. I, I am, it's anecdotal, but I am seeing a lot more people who say they're leaving and then disappear than I have ever seen in, in the history of Facebook. And so it is certainly possible that if users start dropping, Facebook is going to have to act. Um, and then just the, the third potential solution here, which I know Facebook is afraid of, some have implied it's why there seems to have been a little bit of support for Trump in, on Facebook, and that is that perhaps there becomes a little bit of a movement to have Facebook treated as a public utility, and then the government gets involved in overseeing. I think it's unlikely, but even the threat of it could certainly bring some change. But for right now, I mean, why change if you're rolling in money and there's enough ad revenue to go around? And, you know, I, I would hope for greater ethics and morality in Facebook's leader, but I've I've long given up waiting for that to happen. I like that you framed it in the fact that they can't really, they're not really concerned because there's no reason for them to be concerned. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a sting to their pride that a whole bunch of these brands decided to boycott them, but it's not enough of a sting to cause any lasting reaction that's going to potentially change the way they do business. Sam, what's your take on the situation at this point? Or is, I mean, obviously you've got a lot of strong opinions which you've voiced over the past few weeks, but is, have they changed? Is anything new? Are you angrier? What's going on? Well, I'll start off by saying there's, there's some people I know who work at Facebook and, and I love them all and I wish them the best <clears throat> as I clear my throat. <laughs> um, it, 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 that being said, it's a $600 billion business. And as Augie said, it's like number five in terms of market capital. Mark Zuckerberg has 53% of the voting rights. Their ad revenue is $31.5 billion uh, um, e-marketer uh, e predicts for this year, and of which I think political advertising is about 3% of their revenue. In April 2020, they got a $5 billion fine from the S FTC uh, over privacy issues. Uh, and then another data point is they, they, ha they have black representation, about 3.8% and 3.1% of their leadership. And they're currently being sued for racial discrimination by black employees. Hence the um, and there was a memo that was leaked in November 2019, which showed that there were some issues there as well. So those are some data points I'm sharing, some facts out there. And as I as I step back and look at it, I had some interesting um, Twitter exchanges. It's not confidential. It was, it was on Twitter with the Antonio Lucio, the CMO, and I was just pinging him about um, what's going on at Facebook, and he's been a huge advocate for diversity and inclusion. And I'm bringing that angle because the you know, civil rights issues is hate and, disc and discrimination and, and um, the content being pro propagated by Facebook is, is a f impacting pre predominantly you know, African-American black communities um, and other marginalized um, communities with disinformation, misinformation. So that's why I'm, I'm bringing up that angle. And he seems like a good guy. He's talking about, look, I've got, as a CMO, I've got a solve the business issues of black representation in senior roles. He talks about less press ads, more action. And he talks about, you know, every CMO de de deserves brand safety and brand uh, and civility on the platform. So you've got a CMO there who's, who's vested in the right things. But all the numbers I started off with will usurp everything else. So for me, there's only three plays that I can see potentially having impact. I think the first one is, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gets woke. Um, he gets it <laughs> over COVID. Oh, right? no, so, that wouldn't solve anything. A, a woke well, Mark Zuckerberg would be even worse than a Mark so, Zuckerberg who's on Argument number one is he gets woke, COVID, he's changed, and he sees that, you know, this is important because Jews, Muslims, and, and African Americans and black communities are, are, and he realizes, hey, he's not Kylo Ren, but he's actually Ben Solo, um, similar to Jack Dorsey, <laughs> he's given up half his money away. So that 
that is one angle. Second angle, I think, is internal pressure. We've seen employees actually withdraw the labor, labor and have a virtual walkout. Um, and, and so that might, you know, they might they may rise up again. Um, the better angels, I just mentioned Antonio Lucio. So there's, there's leadership there who want to make a difference. Um, there's also... Um, it seems not in the press as much. There's a Facebook oversight committee. So there is an oversight um, committee and board who who essentially have uh, a platform to in you know investigate and to take action. And there's the civil rights movement it, it, and the, you know the, the the boycott is all pushing for a civil rights officer. So that could happen. So that's internal pressure. Or well, the fourth thing is government intervention. I, I, I'm sorry. The third thing is government intervention. And f that's where I've landed. The only thing that's going to work is. Um, you know, one party wins the election, and you probably know where I'm going with this. Elizabeth Warren gets as VP, and she has got no time for, for Mark Zuckerberg and any of those people. Warren is brutal, uh, and then she'd make him sell stuff by force. So you got to sell Instagram to Microsoft, and you got to swap Yammer for WhatsApp, um, and then you're going to make Google swap YouTube for Quibi, uh, and that would fix things very pronto if those threats were put out there because they would they would come to their senses and not want that to happen. And so for me, I, I'm landing on government intervention is the only way out of it because the other two options I cannot foresee happening. You know, the government intervention question, we're going to do a whole topic on the second segment on that, so I don't want to go too far in it. But, you know, there's two aspects of government intervention. I mean, you can take it from the standpoint of, uh, breaking up antitrust regulations, all those things. That, that takes care of a, a lot of the big company doing bad things type of problems. But there's a bigger issue facing the entire social community, which I want to address, you know, which is that whole idea that if um, uh, th this whole idea that politics as a whole and uh, the responsibility of these companies to police their networks is not clearly defined in any kind of legal document. There's no law, there's no regulation, there's nothing that guides and governs this beyond just simple like hate speech legislation, you know, like um uh you know it's, it's like there's 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 nothing there for them to use as a guidepost. And that's a bigger problem that needs to be addressed before any kind of change is going to happen in the industry, even if they do break it up and move it to different players owning the different parts of the company. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that one solving itself without the other. Um, let, me, let me ask you about – well, let's get Jonathan in here first before we go on to the next question. I mean, Jonathan, what's your take on all this malaise going on around Facebook with their – um, there are so, I guess it's the civil rights audit that just happened and the stance that they're going through, the saying, you know, it's like trying to placate people instead of dealing with things head on. Yeah, boy, this is a mess. And you guys, I don't know if just having listened to you three, boy, did you guys open about 10 cans of worms on this <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> That's why I'm not pretending that we're going to be able to talk about anything else on this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. And this is the six oh, hundredth episode. I should be talking about me. I should be talking about yeah, how great that, the show that, is. Welcome but to everyone, this isn't the Beancast. This is the Bob Norp special. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think we should call it that. Um, you know, it's funny. Everything we do, online advertising, social media, uh, you know, in that realm, is about contradiction of terms and about hypocrisy. It really is because we're a capitalist society that says, no, 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 we have to break this up because it's becoming monopolistic or too successful. We're also talking about limiting of hate speech, yet we have things like the fighting words doctrine, where you know, certain words are considered so offensive that you, you can fight them. You know? So First Amendment be damned. So th it's all over the place. The, the one thing that I would say, I, I agree with everything everybody said. I'd start with that. But I'd also say... The, the truth of the matter is this, is everything comes down to money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I also think, you know, the media is chronically telling us that, you know, how to think and, and who to vote for and who, who should be in jail and, and things like that. It's, it's not independent anymore. Facebook was started as a platform to meet women. 
Okay, we all know that. But it starts as one thing. It grows exponentially. It's huge. I think you get, I don't know if it was, it, are they the fourth or the fifth largest company? Fifth largest right fifth. now. But that for me is one of the angles is because they're, they're six, they're six, seven hundred million and a uh, billion. And then you've got, um, I think Google Alphabet about 900. And then you've got Amazon, you've got Microsoft, and then you've got Apple. So okay. I, I, you just have those, I just cannot have the world being decided by those five guys who run those five exactly. companies. Exactly. That's, that's exactly my point. And I think, look, at the, at the end of the day, you have to look at this as the, if you cannot teach Zucker, uh, you can't teach him in his posse, we can't teach them ethical behavior and what we all know is right to do versus legal to do. Okay, that's just the way it is. So at the end of the day, you just got to follow the money and realize these guys aren't going to do anything to change unless it hurts them financially. That's my opinion. Well, I, I would let me, disagree let me... with that because um, if you if he owns fifty three percent of a six hundred and seventy five billion dollar company and his his personal wealth, I think I saw it. I, is it eight thirty-eight or sixty-eight something billion? The the he has the money. The money is not the it's power and prestige, and so if you take the toys away, you you because he he is on par to 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 be number one. His Facebook could be number oh, one. Oh, for sure. But Wait, hold he, on a second. Hold on a second. What are you uh, disagreeing with then? Well. well uh, I mean, what, what the angle I'm coming is about money. It's not a for me the money they've got the money in the bank, so you have I'm to take away that, money that, with that power, though. So yeah, okay, I, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then we're on. Yeah, we're that's what I'm saying because he's right. going to be rich no matter what. But exactly. he can't control. He can't be number one if you take away the toys. Which right. again, it sounds like oh, who are you, Sam? But th this is why for me the only power that is equivalent is governmental power. That's the that's the thing that I, that's what I, it for me again. I use the the Star Wars. It's it's the um, you know the 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 other analogy I was using was you know the whole Thanos situation. If you're an Avengers fan, spoiler alert, that he, he gets all the rings, and he wipes away half the universe. The only power that you can compete with, you know, he, if Zuckerberg's Thanos, and then you've got um, you know Sam Jesseril Sandberg as Proxima Midnight, just another fan fan dro name drop there. You, 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 the only thing you can conquer that is other superheroes, and the only other superheroes who are strong enough are governments. That's the only thing that can I can with. I can out nerd you. Uh, Kim, the novels of Kim Stanley Robinson talking about uh, Red or Red Mars, uh, those books. They uh, proposed this idea that multinationals will become meta nationals, and that meta nationals would be more powerful and have more influence than any government. That governments would take a back seat to that. It's a it's a not an, are we uh, there? That's where we are, aren't we? Bob? We're, we're, we're Isn't that where we are. That's where we are. We're getting yeah, to that. It's a na it's a nat right. it's a natural evolution where you know we have companies taking over government functions. You know, like we have companies starting their own health plans. You know, not just trying to plans, start their own currencies. Start their own currencies. <laughs> I mean, all these things are happening already, and it's just, it's it's going to happen. I mean, it's just like. I don't think that government necessarily has the power to step in, but let me, let me, if it's all about following the money and, you know, we obviously have brands that are sort of maybe kind of committed to this boycott, but maybe for a month and then they're going to be back or maybe they're just reevaluating for half a year and then they'll be back. Um, how are these findings by the auditors uh, in terms of the things where Facebook is failing in civil rights type practices? What what is the impact of brand safety, and how should brands be responding long term to this? Is it if it doesn't matter to consumers, then right? You know, is is there a risk to brands at all? Now, nobody, no CMO wants to see their ad run beside a group of white supremacists, right? And and we get that. Um, but at the end of the day, this audit influences nothing with consumers you know this Correct. is again a, a reputational hit to sandberg and uh and zuckerberg and and to facebook um but unless people care the risk i think is relatively low and, and i think you're right i think a lot of these uh advertisers will be back now the thing is is that by being so um by stonewalling as the leaders have at Facebook, the challenge here is how do you crawl back to Facebook when they are just being jerks, right? Like if they don't give you anything, 
do you just go, well, you know, I guess civil rights be damned and I'm going to be back, um, which is why I think Facebook is going to be forced to just toss a bone at some point here in the next 30 to 60 days. I think it'll be a new feature, like it'll be a little more, as I say, transparency or control. It won't change the world. Everyone gets to say, I got something out of this, uh, and except probably the, the people who really care about but, civil rights. But, right? yeah, I think Which, if, but yeah, Augie's talked about earlier about um, the, the sort of the dynamic of um, this, is an, this is causing addiction. And it just made me immediately go to tobacco, where for, for years and years and years, nothing to see here. Oh, no, it is actually carcinogenic and kills you. Oh, we knew that all along. So all the bad behavior was then led to legislation you can't advertise. Um, there's warnings on products. There's age limits. So there are proxies. There are examples in recent history that can be immediately uh, in, in place. Uh, but but in place even, even those aren't perfect in terms of but, dealing with this because it's, you know, social media, the problem is not the... I mean, let, let's face it, um, any kind of social media as a, as a whole can elevate and accelerate an idea. So we know that mm -hmm. that's the truth. But the true problem here is that people are monetizing that in the process. And because people are monetizing it, it gives a huge incentive for people to manipulate the news and manipulate things to make things even worse. So, yeah. so it's this, you know, in some ways... You can't just blanket say social media has a problem. We need to regulate it like we do tobacco without dealing with the monetization problem, which is the true source of the problem as far as I can, I can ascertain from this conversation and from previous conversations we've had. Well, you, you're right there, Bob. The, the, these products had a fundamental design flaw in them. And so it makes me think Cindy Gallup is having a conversation, I think she said this coming week with LinkedIn, about all the sexual harassment and um, sexism, sexism and misogyny happening on LinkedIn. It's like, oh, no, is this happening? Oh, yes, it is. What shall we do? Microsoft, who owns LinkedIn. So the design flaws, the, the, ease, the, easy, the, the ability to spread hate uh, and micro-target people, that was built into the product. So, again, seatbelts were invented by Volvo. They gave them to the world. And, you know, some countries you had to legislate to make people wear seatbelts in order to make make to raise the bar to make things better for everyone so again i'm not some big uh, sort of socialist type driving person whatever government controls everything but i cannot see another way other than as i said the three options of, you know mark gets woke and he suddenly gets enlightened so, which he has done over covid but this issue he's out on record again so he is actively not wanting to do it and like you said oh him and cheryl sandberg aren't dummies so and they've got 600 billion dollar companies Company. His personal wealth is what, 85 billion, and the, the the audit said they're dragging their heels. Oh no, they don't know what to do. Oh no, they're moving so slowly. Really? Come on, son. Uh, it, it's it's by choice. That's why you have to have the only authority which can um, Im, um, Im, impact them now is is the government. Because consumers, I, I'm, again, I'm I'm all for boycotts. However, it's it's like boycotting oxygen. I could decide to do it, but I, I'm not going to win that boycott. So that that's that is, they're too powerful now in, in my well, mind. Well, to that point, and I, I think you're right, because if you look at, look, the, the CMOs at the end of the day, they have to, they have their bottom line that they have to be incredibly worried about, right? So if your customers are on Facebook and Facebook is just going through the motions to try to appease some of these groups, at the end of the day, you're not going to give a crap. You're going to want to get in there and get your customers and leave it at that. And besides that, Americans in particular, we have a very short memory span. So as soon as huh? something is, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't remember what you just said. You said um, that. If, <laughs> but that's what happens. It's flavor of the month today. As soon as you know something else takes over the news, the elections are going to screw up everything for marketing products because they're on the airwaves. So you know you got to look at it this way. It, unless something detrimental happens to the bottom line financially of Facebook, that at the end of the day, the CMOs that are targeting their customers and everybody there, they've got to stick to Facebook. So unless something drastic happens, nothing's going to change. Can I can I get philosophical? I know you want to move on, uh, Bob, but just for like 60 seconds, just get philosophical, which is everything we've talked about uh, and, and if we look at the larger world and what's going on with COVID um, – Maybe we need to not give up on trying to get, and I'm not saying this is an easy solution. I know I'm going to sound like Pollyanna here, but maybe we need to start trying to educate consumers to be more educated consumers. Because 
this nation is in a terrible state with COVID compared to the rest of the world. And it's mm -hmm. because we've been in this debate about how we can't possibly shut down businesses and the almighty dollar, uh, even if it's at the great loss of life. That's right. Which is yeah. very likely becoming. And while that seems like it is completely unrelated, it is exactly related to this, which is people are, you know, there are a lot of people who care about these issues, right? There are people who care, but they keep signing on to Facebook because, you know, at the end of the day, it gives them what they want. I, I, so while I agree with everything that's been said in terms of the possible solutions, uh, Zuck getting woke, government intervention, you know, maybe all of this, maybe 2020 needs to tell us that there is an opportunity to teach Americans uh, over time what it means to be careful consumers and to put uh, – as important as the economy and jobs and businesses to put everything into perspective, because it looks to me as a guy who's been locked in his home for five months, uh, like we have lost a lot of perspective. Are you suggesting we reintroduce civics into the curriculum at high schools? <laughs> you know what, Pollyanna, let me tell you. <laughs> well, well, and, but one, Listen, one element. No, here's, and... here's the answer. Here's the answer. So oftentimes it happens. We live our lives in chains and we never even knew we had the key. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that analogy is not really working for me in the current climate. Um, with the yeah, well, let me let me one um, more one more issues thing. going on in America. But I, I was just going to say, the, uh, okay, I hear I hear what you're saying. The problem with that is is that if we if the analogy of COVID is, is problematic simply because the people who, again this is another classic one. The people who are disproportionately it negatively impact are the minorities, black and Hispanic communities who have institutional barriers to succeeding in the current system so the the it's all well and good saying hey the consumer you know and educate the consumer but the the the, the there is a there is a an imbalance in the consumer that in the marketplaces there is and so the 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 constituents who are being disproportionately uh, affected are being marginalized from the power from the from the decision making from the authority so i, I think there is uh, or non decision making uh, I, well, yeah. let me let me, so, let me let me let me let me before i know where you're going on this sam but i want i want to clarify and, and give augie a chance to clarify we're not talking about consumers here we're talking about citizens you know it's just like people need to be aware of what the impact of social media is. They need to be in, uh, educated about what the, the potential problems are with the media. And, and we need to train people and educate them in the school system to be better computer users. And I think that that's a reasonable thing to say. Even, I mean, yes, there are inequities, you know, it's just like there are imbalances in, in the population. From a consumer standpoint, some people are locked out of, uh, opportunities that other people, you know, take for granted. But at the same time, we need to somehow educate people about what social's impact is and stop them from uh, at least give give us a fighting chance to, you know, not let these lies and hatred spread at the rate that they do. Am I okay? Am I just pre preaching to nobody? <laughs> well, yeah, you're no. preaching to the converted. That, that we're, we're all sold. And I, I just come back to. If I look at, because there is in the U.S. there's going to be a, a hearing, and and basically, is it, I think Cook, Zuckerberg, Bezos, and and Sundar, they all agreed that they'd go together, so that <laughs> they got they got they're going as a posse there's to, to be a see. Lot of hand there, I think, and and, you know. and it's it's hilarious. So they've all, I was no, we won't use the word colluded. I'm not saying colluded. They've all uh, sort of spoken to say, hey, let's all go together to get our our, our lashings together, and then go back. No, and, they colluded. <laughs> throw, you said that, that throw a bone and then carry on regardless. Oh. But those are the top five. That's like trillions. Of, I don't know. Was it four or five hundred um, billion dollars worth of business there? I, I just can't see it hap changing. I'm, I again, I am a glass half um, half full. I'm an optimist. I, and so I, 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 I'm, I'm, I would love the Augie's argument to succeed. I'm part of that movement. And perhaps 2021 will be in that mind space. But in 2020, that's not where the majority of people are in, in North America, but in Europe and other places, I, I, yeah, they're going to get absolutely locked down because they, they are seeing the impact of this um, fake news and, and hate. And yeah. those governments and those economies will absolutely uh, um, 
penalize and, and, Im, and impose legislation yeah, on. And I yeah, should clar- I should clarify. I you know I don't think any of us are saying that Augie's idea is going to actually happen. You know, unfortunately, <laughs> that's no. But you know what? I, I think, <laughs> I mean, look, you guys, so having worked in advertising, I mean, particularly for the agencies, we always used to say sales overnight, brand over time, right? So I always looked at things that there's two answers to every challenge or problem. And I think what these guys are saying, you know, a lot of the responses or lack of responses, which say just as much as the response, when it comes down to Facebook and things like that, there's what can we do immediately and then what can we do over time? And I don't hear anybody having that conversation which is strange to me because you can't just have a blanket thing saying we're changing something today. Culture, uh, societal culture, uh, a corporate culture, they exist. And whether well, they're right or wrong, that's what you got to do an impactful well, change let's, today. Let's, take, let's, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Pollyanna Ish, it does suggest that uh, we're not having that conversation. Like I need to, uh, I need to yeah, apologize I for suggesting we be better consumers, which, which <laughs> just makes the point you're making, Jonathan. Well, hey, no, but, it's, but you agree with me, right? I mean, it's like, look, yeah, the yeah. thing is, is that I, I 100%, man, if, look, if we, it, 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 crime is up, so you hire more police. Now, technically, that doesn't really make sense. Okay. What you got to do is if you start back at the education thing and say, this will all be solved because everybody's going to get a great education and 20 years from now, there's going to be no crime. Okay, great. 20 years from now, I'll be dead. Yeah. You know, one of the things I wanted to bring up was The Verge points out that while the findings seemed warranted, that everything about the the uh, civil rights audit seemed uh, on the up and up and was accurate in terms of its uh, assessment of the company, the proposed solutions seemed a little bit lacking. Um, Sam, does the solution need to be you know, beyond just having more Facebook internal oversight? I mean, the way the article put it was, you know, the solution to Facebook is not more Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I, I just, um, how could I say? It, yeah, the, they, they basically um, sucked all the air out of the room and everyone's focusing on Facebook. I mean, I guess you have Yammer, I guess you have Twitter, I guess you have other platforms uh, and other mediums and other forms out there. And if it's about raising the bar and um, maybe it's investing in, in other alternatives, other platforms and, and creating inclusive spaces and championing those. So to the, to the points that were made earlier, perhaps we are doing ourselves a bit of a disservice by trying to fix Facebook. Maybe we give up on them and actually invest in the the future, the innovation, the new ideas, the more, as I say, the more inclusive spaces, the, the, the more um, international platforms. So it's not an English language driven thing. I know that some of the platforms like TikTok now, there's, there's concerns over the Chinese government um, and, and, and the data and, and integrity and, and those types of thing there. But maybe if we, if we are, if we cultivate more global and diverse opportunities, platforms, technology innovations, there will be alternatives that become new magnets that basically take the business or take the consumer and take the eyeballs away from the current incumbents. And actually, I guess we should, what, we, we just don't know what the cycle is for in this industry, but my hope is actually, like anything, in 10 years' time, we would, we would you know, Facebook is my space and we would have moved on to something else. My hope is it's better because I just don't believe they can reform themselves. Well, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we were going to go into the next pod talking about the politics surrounding this. And that's exactly what we're going to do, uh, talking about social as a whole and the political realities of legislation and regulations and what is not there and what is there in terms of guidance for them. Going forward, it should be an interesting conversation. But for the moment, I want to talk about our sponsor for this evening, Methodify by Delvinia, and give you or someone you know another chance to get a $20 Amazon gift card just for checking them out. Now, we all know behind every brand are people like you or me or your uh, workers or employees And you're all making decisions right now under a lot of stress. And you're talking to consumers who are also highly stressed out and highly sensitive. And you say one wrong thing in your advertising and you're going to unleash a social media firestorm against your brand. This is where our sponsor, Methodify by Delvinia, can help you. Methodify collects real feedback from your actual customers on concepts or creative before you release it to the world. And the whole process will take you just hours. I said that right. Just hours, not days. 
Methodify gives insight professionals and senior marketing people the information they need to power better decisions that will protect their brands and themselves. Now, Methodify has been used to test lots of things during this time of crisis. Um, they've been testing digital creative for a number of brands in a lot of different categories to help them uh, make sure their ad messaging wasn't exactly tone deaf, as we know a lot of brands have been over the past few weeks and months. It was invaluable information for their customers, and Methodify can do the same for you. Actual customer feedback is a game changer because right now brands that wait and see are going to wind up making costly mistakes. Now, we always say this at the end of the ad, connect with your customers. We want you to connect with your customers. We want you to build relationships. We want you to build trust and build fans. But in the process, we also want you to test everything, and Methodify can get you started today. Now, to find out more about Methodify and to set up a demo, just Methodify it. Go to methodify.it slash beancast. That's M-E-T-H-O-D-I-F-Y dot I-T slash beancast. As a way of saying thank you, every Beancast listener who signs up and completes a demo will receive a $20 Amazon gift card just for your time. And remember, don't just keep this to yourself. Tell your professional associates. Tell your friends. Tell everybody about this. So again, that address is methodify.it slash beancast, and we thank them very much for their support of our program. Well, the Facebook issue that is often conflated with the problem of hate speech on the platform is that of truthfulness or hatefulness of political speech. However, the issues really, really need to be treated separately because the regulations governing ads and commentary from politicians are a different beast entirely. They don't have anything to do with each other in a lot of ways. Uh, politicians are granted much more freedom mm. in what they say and what they do, and they're not held to the same standards as brands. Yeah, go figure. Social as a whole is wrestling with this issue. Facebook chooses unfettered free discourse. Google chooses hindered uh, targeting abilities. Twitter chooses no ads at all, but mostly unfettered posting. But an American Bar Association article this past week shows that none of the approaches really work in the absence of clear federal guidelines for political advertising on social. Sam, do the distinctive differences of social from other media make it impossible for any self-regulation without congressional innovation? I know that's a stupid question for me to ask you because <laughs> I, in the last pod, you pretty much said flat out that they do need some kind of guidance. But I'm talking more about the, the type of guidance that's given to media in terms of political speech. Uh, things like uh, in newspapers, they're mm -hmm. responsible for what's said about them, uh, what, what's, what's said in their pages. But on TV, they have something called equal time, which makes TV completely absolved of any kind of recourse for the things that, they say, that are said on their airwaves. So where does social media fit in there, and, and can they actually self-regulate without some kind of clear guidance on that issue alone? Well, as I read this um, ABA article, I did feel that um, the legalese was coming back, and it does actually help with my um, hourly rate because it does um, probably add an extra <laughs> zero if I could try right. fill at, at legal rates versus um, senior marketer rates. But in all seriousness, Bob, it was it was an interesting read because you're right. Newspapers, different rules to um, to broadcast media because that's limited. They they have to run political ads, but then they're absolved. Um, and then but but cable news is is less um, limited, so they can they can choose what what to do or what not to do, and. This is the problem. As you start reading about broadcast and newspapers and cable, and then being an internet internet service provider that is how the Twitters and the um, the the category that these these Google, Facebook, Twitter fall under, you realise that they get all of the upside and none of the, none of the downside. So it's like, oh no, uh, the broadcast airways are limited. You have to you have to run political ads and follow those rules. And but the internet is unlimited, and and so the category that the internet falls under for me is convenient because it's basically a loophole that they've they've managed to exploit and in the loophole they're in they're a private company so they could set their own rules and they could either choose to accept ads or not or um, play or not play and again 
show looking at the dollars and the money the the option picked by the alphabets of this world and the facebooks of this world allows them to make a lots more more money versus the twitter option which is actually constraining their valuation and their their profitability so it's an actual it's just it is a, a money driven thing and i i as you re realize the rules facebook are operating relatively appropriately they could be more stringent in the category they're in they're not the worst well they probably are the worst but the, the <laughs> rules allow them to be bad and so it's an it's an if you look at it from a legal perspective facebook aren't necessarily the 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 they're, they're playing with the rules they have so you the thing is you're gonna have to change the rules i think now you have to redefine what internet service providers are and realize that in 2020 they do play in a different way and not having those categories that have been grandfathered in rewrite the redefine the categories so that they have more scrutiny and more and and, and more of the expectations is how i would answer the question going forward because i keep saying there's a product flaw that's designed into the category they're in and it's causing this problem. Uh, the other issue you mentioned about political speech, and actually, you know, b based on you know history and um, the constitution, I, I I do appreciate the fact that you are you are allowed to say some whatever you want, and then allow people to hear it and make their own conclusions, and to to decide. So I get the 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 sort of the 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 context of why political speech is different to other types of speech and ty other types of content however i still think there's opportunity to to force the, the the those players into the right category or redefine the category so they, they the rules are a bit tighter you know most of the outcry against social media in terms of political advertising uh, and we're talking about political advertising political speech we're talking about the whole gamut of politicianing and um, what is it, campaigning online. Um, most of the complaining has been the result of the Trump election. I mean, and uh, by, by subsequent election of other leaders around the world who are equally distasteful to certain elements of the more liberal populations within the, within the world populace. I, mean, I could have said that more eloquently, but... You know, what it is, is um, what I'm trying to get back to is if, if social media is such a problem, then we've got, to, we've got to regulate it as opposed to just saying that these companies need to change what they're doing. Because is social media really the problem, though? I mean, so I guess the question I'd ask, if you don't mind me sort of jumping in, No, please, because you know, I'm not is, doing um, a good job. <laughs> because, you know, we've, we've just talked about what Alphabet is doing, and Alphabet really doesn't necessarily fit social media. We can argue that YouTube this and, and you know. Uh, but ultimately, the problem is that online... So in the old days, a TV ad got submitted, um, and the networks reviewed it. Right? <laughs> you know, they they took a look. Does this belong on our platform? Right? Nowadays, everyone can just do what they want on any internet platform at all. Like there's there's zero reviews, and so we've we've opened up this wild west. And and you know, Facebook, for instance, is being bringing transparency to political advertising and you can go out and look at the 8,000 ads that the Trump campaign has taken out. And I'm sure probably an equal number for Biden. I'm not making a political statement here, but because it's just so easy, you can do variations based on this or that, and this region, and that region. And so I guess what I'm saying here is we keep talking about social media. Um, I think the problem, honestly, is we need regulation of political advertising, period. Like, it shouldn't matter whether it's on TV or it's on YouTube or it's on Facebook. The rules should apply, right? And so I think that's the problem that we've got. And, and I sometimes think what happens is we get off on a tangent when we start talking about what do we need to do in social media as opposed to other things. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the unpaid organic posts of Trump or Biden or whomever generally aren't the problems. Those need to be applied by whatever the, whatever the terms and conditions are, are of the platform. But that, that's the point, Augie. But, it, but that's the point, Augie. Something that a thousand people see to a hundred thousand or a million, that's when we run into a problem and it brings it back to what are the rules for political advertising on any platform. Well, but that's, that, that's the exact point I was trying to make very badly at first. But I mean, 
if you go ahead and say that the individual's post is less effective and less troublesome than the ads, then the whole argument against social media falls apart because we're, we're in this mess and we're feeling this way because of the way that certain troll farms not only used ads but used the ability to amplify the speech and the memes and the false information and everything else via the, the regular Could social sharing network. advertising? I, I don't think they could have. I think they could have. I mean, because that's that's where the strength of the the platform really I'm, shows. I'm it's where one that. person. I, I will say this though that that obviously some, at some point algorithms come into this. We didn't talk about it on this show. I think you had it on a past show that the that the internal study that Facebook did and and was revealed a couple of months ago found that 64 percent of the joins to extremist groups came as a result of Facebook's own recommendation. So people mm -hmm. aren't finding extremist mm -hmm. groups from each mm -hmm. other. They're finding it because Facebook is telling them to join and then making money off of the fact that they see the extremist posts. So I, your point is well taken, but I still think that so much of what we get bent out of shape about isn't that you know some unknown account that is run by a farm in some foreign country gets a couple hundred followers, it's that they can put money behind it. I mean, that's what the problem in 2016 on Facebook had to do with all the political advertising that was pointing people to fake events and extremist groups. So maybe, the, you know, this is complex. I still think that we need standard political advertising rules regardless. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with you. I mean, look, we all know that there is a, an established hypocrisy between mediums, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there's no consistency. The only, the only thing that I'd add to this is this, is I, you can govern something to death, and there's always a workaround. And I've brought this up before. There's always a constant race between the bullet and the bulletproof vest, right? Make a faster, stronger bullet make a better vest and you go back and forth. Well, as soon as the perceived anonymity behind the web is always going to work in favor of whoever's posting. So if it doesn't come from Trump or Biden, it comes from a perceived supporter of theirs, even if it's from their camp. Governing it is an exercise in futility because it's just going to keep adapting and changing and give you a perceived anonymity. Oh, this isn't approved by Trump. This isn't approved by Biden, but it's out there. So that's the danger. So, you know, what do you do? Do you open the floodgates and say everybody can say whatever the hell they want? I, you know, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I'm just saying what's going to happen is it's gonna, the conversation will evolve. It will be come from mysterious circumstance or mysterious venues, and you're not going to see where it's coming from, but it's still going to make its point. So you can govern it to death, but it's going to be spinning our wheels, I'm afraid. You know, and I agree as well. I mean, I think government regulation is necessary. That's what I've been advocating for for this whole show so far, I think. Um, being very clear about that. But when I came away from the ABA article, when I finished reading it, my first thought was maybe it's it's justifies a little bit what these corporate leaders and these social platforms have been doing. I mean, they've each taken a different tact, but and there you can't really fault them for taking these tacts because there's no real guidance from anybody saying what to do. And all of their opinions are legitimate opinions. Um when you're talking about Mark Zuckerberg, as much as you, we would want to make him our, you know, we just want to revile him for what he's done. What it comes, yeah, vilify him for what he's done. <laughs> revile either way. I just but, wanted to say a big word. Thank you. But as much as we'd like to do that, it's just like his stance that political discourse should be open and unfettered is not a bad stance. It's something that most liberal um, politicians and most liberal leaning of political affiliate uh, people would f would definitely agree with as would most conservatives free and unfettered speech is a good thing it's just that in the this case it doesn't seem to be a good thing and you know when you look at twitter okay it makes sense get rid of all political ads but at the same time you're pretty much squashing the opportunity for anybody who's a small player to get noticed because the big that's players right. that, that's a great point bob because you know what sometimes by saying nothing you spoke it loudly you know right so i mean you know we can we can make fun of the social networks and say they're being um, bad stewards of what we're we're supposed to be doing, but uh, and we can put the pressure on them to either break up or to you know have better controls over what's being said on their platforms. 
But really, there is no government regulation to guide them in this. So it's, it comes down to Congress isn't doing their job. It has nothing to do with the, the companies. I mean, it's just like it has I a— I think that lets off the companies a little easy. I think your point is well taken. Um, and, but I'm not convinced that unfettered— it brings, I mean, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole thread of this conversation, it seems to me, has been about, uh, been, been about money. But I've always argued and sometimes gotten a lot of pushback. Somebody will maybe push back on me on this on Twitter after all this is over and, and online. But it isn't unfettered when you give power and wealth more um, access, more voice than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Right. I can say, hey, I think that Trump is a problem and you should vote for somebody else. Trump can say uh, when the looting starts, the shooting starts and then puts a million dollars behind it. Are we arguing that that's equal? Because I could put a million dollars behind mine if I theoretically had it. And so we keep talking in theoreticals as if unfettered access uh, it exists in social media, which it does not. Right. I mean, let's let's acknowledge it doesn't because of money. Um, and I think no, once you bring we're money not we're not it, talking about. I, I, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying unfettered access. I'm not. That's not my point. The point is unfettered in the sense of speech being presented, you know, the unfettered discourse that's happening online uh, gives everybody the opportunity to be intelligent and look at that and say, I agree with that or I disagree with it. And it's just like that is a perfectly legitimate democratic ideal uh, of this country to, to hear free speech and make a decision on your own accord. Obviously, we know the problems with Facebook and we know the problems with that in this instance, but it's still a democratic ideal. So how can you fault Mark Zuckerberg for taking that stance um, so without, not, though, without, that, without some kind of guidance? Point. He's become a billionaire by saying that he has unfettered equal access, but then giving people with power and wealth more access. He he profits from that. And so his stand Still not I, what I'm saying, talking about, I find to be hypocritical. Yes, I agree now, with you one hundred percent. I agree with nobody you. Nobody should be able to buy access. No, right? I agree, I agree with you one hundred percent. I agree with you one hundred percent about that. Well, I mean it's yeah, a, I when just, talking about would, the only thing I would add is that Zuckerberg is a Martian. So <laughs> <laughs> let's look at it that way. Well, I want to move on real quickly to the last topic before we wrap up the show. Um, Gardner predicts a seven. Uh, I'm sorry, we talked a lot last week about the efficacy of a boycott of social, particularly Facebook, and whether brands were committed to the cause of just ducking and covering, or, or just ducking and covering during these hard times. Well, this past week we got an answer of sorts in a Gartner survey that showed most CMOs expect an increase in social spending in 2021. Jonathan, what does this reveal about the true ability of any boycott in the space to, to affect change? I mean, here we have the brands, again, all saying we're going to support the boycott, but all of them are going, but we're going to spend more money on social next year. I mean, yeah. It's just like how much of a commitment is there to lasting change on the platforms and how much more responsibility should the brands be taking for this and making a little bit more firmer stance? I looked, I, this is me. Okay. And, and uh, right now I'm, I am a CMO. So I, uh, this is coming from my perspective and I'm certainly open to hearing everybody else's, but I think, look, the way I'm looking at this, I looked at the boycott as an excuse. I think there's a lot of, and I know that's going to ruffle some feathers here, but, but I think it's an excuse. I think a lot of CMOs are confused. They don't know, okay, get us out of this. Find the right spend. To clarify, right. you're not saying the boycott is an excuse. You're saying that people participating in the boycott is they're using it as an excuse. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I'm okay. Sorry. Clarify. Uh, well said. Um, Bob will be my translator for the remainder of the show. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody else has been covering my back, so I mean, I appreciate you all. Okay, well, thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I looked at it as a, a little bit of a cop out. Look, let's. We don't know what to do yet, so yeah, we're gonna stop our spend for a month, which is like you know, throwing a stone off of Mount Everest and saying Mount Everest is lighter now. And I also think that how do you know when a CMO is lying when they either talk about the health benefits of their product or they tell you their budget? Those are the, the and I'm a CMO, so I can say that. But that, that's the way I look at it. I think, I really believe that 
this uh, the the boycott is uh, is an exercise in futility. I think what's going to happen is you have to go back to our earlier conversation. You have to go where the money is, and you have to go into what's working for you and understand what's not and why. I don't think it's going to do any good, and I think it was lip service. So what's the answer here? I mean, Sam, I mean, if, if a brand is beholden to shareholder value or at least to investor value and making sure that the brand succeeds mm-hmm. and the place where everybody's has their attention is on social media mm-hmm. and that's the place to get customers, you're going to go and put your money into the place where the customers are and where you're getting the response that you need. So... I mean, how do you break that cycle when there's nothing, there's no alternative to to go toward um, that is equally as effective? That's a a, a great question, and it's a billion dollar it, question. It, right? Well, it, it then forces you to have purpose and have um, values and living to them. And so some brands do, and some and most brands don't. And so I think for the answer is okay. Are you going to boycott Facebook for life? Is all of Facebook bad? No. Are all people at Facebook bad? No. Is everything that you know Facebook does a lot of for, for, for charity and raises funds for good good causes? And those causes, you know, in the current COVID, a lot of um, re- a lot of businesses, the only vehicle to get to market is through Facebook and to get awareness. So it's complicated. However, I think the brands and um, companies and organisations who have the means could spend less, spend differently. It's like Small Business Saturday. Everyone could spend in, in the big big box stores, but hey, do something better for society for the greater good to raise the bar. We don't believe that a lot of these platforms are raising the bar or vested in raising the bar. How could we spend our dollars differently? Again, it, it's it, it's personal choice, and you know, on a very personal level, I I did own stock in in Facebook up until about um, a month ago, and it was just it, 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 I just kept me kept me awake at night. So I sold the stock. Now I probably got it in my four hundred one k and other places. I can't manage those individually, but it was a personal choice. You know, I did it. Um, so you can make personal choices, and the power of boycotts and movements is that if every uh, and individuals, if collectively individuals come together, they actually have the power to change the world. And so I do believe in boycotts. This one is not going to work in short term because I just don't believe CMOs are going to be fighting for what I'm fighting because I'm probably I probably I am a, an atypical CMO. However, I envision I envision a future when the CMOs and the decision makers. Are, are, are thinking differently and as we see public benefit corporations growing and people being more purpose centric and more ethical and brands are being rewarded with better sales so i i see it growing and there is there's there's a catalyst for more of this thinking but it's going to be uh, i think a longer term play than the yeah, short term play yeah you're right greed is a greed is a powerful beast to try to combat you know so uh, there's just when it, when there's so much money out there that you're up against it's very hard to combat that well, before we get to this week's fair, fail, foul, and before we get to the shameless updates, uh, sh- shameless plugs that we usually do at this section of the show, I do want to take a quick kind of uh, moment to acknowledge the fact that we've made it to 600 episodes. Um, that is, well done, Bob. It's 12 years of a lot of work and a lot of, uh, a lot of great conversations over this time. So I just wanted to ask you guys if you had any special memories or anything that's going on, because all of you have been either long-term listeners, long-term um, participants on the show, uh, yeah, at least for some of you. I mean, uh, God, Jonathan, you've been doing the show for quite a while, probably back about six years. Oh, yeah. I got to tell you, you know, there's a couple things that stand out. I know uh, I've had some heated debates, and I know we were joking about me reinvigorating my passion uh i i emily binder there was one where we did a show with and she was one of the guests and everything was emily is right and we just kept going back to i agree with emily because we didn't want to get her too impassioned to fight us on anything and the other thing that always stands out to me is i i love bob you're one of my best friends i love this show and i'll never forget the first message i got from somebody who listened to the show from germany Oh wow, and that's great! I thought, oh my God, somebody from another country is hearing me uh, <laughs> spew my stuff, and I thought, oh my God, this is just awesome. So th- those are the two things that really stand out to me: is is Emily, uh, and she's always right, and getting messages from people in other countries who listen to the show. How about you, Augie? What's your what's your memories of the show? What 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 do you always think of when you come back to it? 
Well, obviously, I always enjoy the conversation on here. Uh, you, you know such smart people. Um, and it's, it's been easy for me to recommend this to people. The, the, one of the, the favorite uh, uh, situations, I hate to talk about the time I was on, but I, I have always expected, because I know that this gets engagement, and I see people sharing about it, but I've had very little sort of people reaching back out to I get I very rarely do as somebody say I agree with you very rarely do they say I disagree and honestly one of my favorite moments you'll remember this is just I think uh, late last year maybe earlier this year but I was on being a provocative guy you know trying to spark good conversations I made a very overly broad statement about um, campaigns in the, the last 10 years I think I said something along the lines of there hasn't been a good campaign um, and I got pushback people somebody online started an argument with me and you were part of that and I enjoy that like you know I don't mind somebody telling me <laughs> I know, I know exactly frankly, what you're talking about frankly I this I was wrong that time, <laughs> you know, and so, so you know, it got it was an opportunity for me to learn and acknowledge, and and it had turned into a good conversation, and so that that was my favorite moment was somebody pushing back and saying that I was kind of full of crap because at that moment I was. Oh, that's, that's awesome, funny. Sam. Any thoughts? Anything you want to share? Well, Bob, for me, the my fond memories of the show are just from when I first discovered it, it was about 2009 when I moved to the US is just basically shouting at the, you know, the, the device I was broadcasting on, arguing with everyone on the show. And it just caught my attention and caught my imagination. But I remember, uh, I remember interacting with you bef way before we well, even yeah, became friends. So this we were, back in the day. We were but, back but, in the, ad, I think it was the Ad Week uh, Ning page. <laughs> just like, oh. it, it, yeah, we, we're, we're aging ourselves. But Bob, I want to take you back to <laughs> April 2008 because... The very first bean cast was called Fear of the Customer, and it featured Neil Feinstein, Al Gadbert, and Karen Evan. And I was listening to that this morning. And it's it's kind of quite spooky because I don't know if you remember that show, Bob, but the I topics do. you were talking about were this pesky thing called social networks and their role in advertising campaigns. And Starbucks had launched this My Starbucks idea, and was it just it was only a platform you could say yes to and like their ideas. You couldn't really create two two way dialogue. And Facebook came up, uh, and it was a fifteen billion dollar company at the time. And so as I was listening to this show, and the Dove campaign came up, was it? Oh, this is an example of people really being deep. And you talked about Philips TV from online user groups and how that influenced people and then the other topic that came up was the green is green a thing and the other guest said not really for us and you said well i think it's for me this green environmental stuff it's a thing and then there's a bit on walmart as if you know walmart's a legit uh, walmart they've just low price and how walmart has evolved over the last 12 years or so so i'm listening to this show thinking wow it's the power of going back to the beginning and then looking ahead seven to 10 years and building foresight and being a futurist. Because what we're talking about today, we, you didn't, when you first did that episode, you didn't know that the whole world was being ruined by Facebook and it's a $600 billion. <laughs> no, we, didn't I did know, not. we didn't foresee these issues, but yes, but actually you did. You were talking about what, what matters then as you are today. So for me, what was like, it's just a privilege to be on the show and be part of it because from, if anyone listening, I'm saying take, take note of what we're talking about today because where are things going to be in three, five, 10, 12 years time? Are you backing the right things or are you, are you ignoring the wrong things? Are you not taking part in social because you think it's stupid? Well, now guess what? It's the biggest thing. And, and so, and then there's, you talked about email marketing, making it relevant again. And I was thinking, wow, these, these are all the key issues of marketers and where are we today? So my memory is of, I, I said, I went back to that fear of the customer first episode it was just on point that's a top the topics you covered then are just as relevant today uh, but the world has changed so much that for me is just what i take away when i think about this uh, first of all those are great great thoughts and thank you so much for the comments because i love the consistency I, I i i went and listened to that first episode uh last uh, in like a couple of years ago and i was doing it with cringe teeth thing it's going to be awful and i listened to it and it's like it's as good as the show today i mean yep. it was from the beginning it was real strong was so well except that we're on it bob yeah except that you're on it <laughs> this is actually a much better show really. no when i when i think about moments for me it's, it's always been meeting the listeners um because and it's not just because yay i'm, I'm doing this podcast and people want to be fans it's more that people out there really want to engage me in debate so i understand what you're what you're talking about guys I mean the way that people reach out to me and and want to meet for coffee and then they want to talk about the marketing issues that we discussed here and I think it's just been so amazing to get so many great meaningful conversations um, from so many diverse top on so many diverse topics from so many diverse people um, 
But if I have to choose one moment that I always go back to, and this is why I wanted Angela Natividad on the show today. I'm, I'm sorry that she couldn't make it. Um, you know, when I go back to it, I just remember her trying to tell George Parker how all ducks are rapists. So she had read an article that all ducks are rapists and that rapist ducks became like this going through thing. I've never laughed so hard in my life. It was just this ongoing conversation. Um, I don't think that's and, the rapist. I think that's therapist. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody remembers that from Saturday Night Live, thank you. But it was just like Angela was just laughing and trying to convince George that all ducks were rapists. And George being George was just dropping mm -hmm. F-bomb after F-bomb. It was just hysterical. <laughs> uh, George Parker. Yeah, he was a, he's a legend of the show. Wow. Well, anyway, it's time for the fair, fail, foul. But before we do that, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Sam Mani. You can find him at marketingtransform.com. That's the home of his podcast and his consultancy and all the other ways that you want to interact with him. Tell me what's going on in your world. What would you like well, to promote? Well, thanks, Bob. So Across the Pond, Marketing Transformed is my podcast that I co-host with Chris Lawson, my buddy who's based in the UK and I'm based in the US, so not one but two British accents for 25, 30 minutes each week. Each Wednesday, we launch an episode. We've just launched season four. That's live. And we've relaunched the website as well. So there's all new content and blogs on there. And season four is all about the Agile Marketing Action Plan. So each week of this season, we're going to give you a how-to. So how to do vision and mission, how to build a brand, how to turn insights into action is the episode that comes out this coming Wednesday. Uh, there's a marketing playbook coming up, how to build a growth mindset, how to measure what matters. So all of those topics are coming up in this season four. We're really excited that uh, putting it together and really delivering for the audience how-tos. And um, so go, please check us out. You can find me at Samuel Money. If you search me on, on Google, uh, I'm there and present or Twitter, um, less so Facebook. And you can find the podcast at marketingtransformed.com and all good podcasting platforms. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next, we have Augie Ray. You can find him at Gartner.com. That's the place where you can find his blog and his um, great mind if you want to hire it to help your brand uh, do things a little bit better. Tell us what's going on in your world, Augie. What would you like to promote? Yeah, the only thing I'd mention is that we, uh, we're supposed to have a conference, marketing conference, our big annual event in San Diego in June. And hey, guess what? That didn't happen quite as planned i i forget why you know the memory sort of begins to uh, but it, it, we are that is the first sign of scheduled. covid you know that <laughs> <laughs> we are scheduled december 1st through 3rd it's going to be virtual uh we've got lots of great speakers lots of great data new data on the cmo spend we're gonna by the way we, we talked a little bit about the cmo spend survey and earlier on the and the on this uh, podcast and how uh, marketers expect to increase their spend on social. Um, we're going to be repeating that uh, again because there's so much changing so rapidly in the world. And so anyways, it's my way of saying that if you go to Google and search for uh, Gartner Marketing Symposium, uh, December 1st to 3rd, we'll be online with a lot of great content and data. And uh, I hope some of the people listening might want to be part of that. Fantastic. Yeah, Gartner puts on great stuff. So you definitely want to get involved with, it. with that if you are a brand uh, Jonathan Sackett, you can find him at mashburnenterprises.com. Um, you can also find him now at GRK. I have no website. I'm going to leave it up to him to tell you about it. What's going on in your, what's going on in your world, Jonathan? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So grkfresh.com is the website. And Bob, I don't know if you were eating there in Manhattan. There's two in Manhattan, I three have. in DC. Okay. So, uh, I'm in the knee deep in the middle of the rebrand. The, uh, re grand opening is in September. Uh, in uh, in Manhattan, so I got a ton of things going on with that. You're going to see a new name, new conviction. Um, we've got a great chef, Loy L O I. Her place in Manhattan. Uh, it, De Niro goes in there, and um, all kinds of famous people. It's just it's wonderful. So we've got a really neat thing going. We're also going to be in the grocery aisle. We're controlling a Greek aisle, uh, and I can't say the name of the major uh, grocer that's going to be doing that. So that's all coming out within the next month. Um, I would also say, and I'd like, this is important. Please listen to the show and please share it. Mm -hmm. Bob Norp is awesome. Uh, I love this show. Uh, the guests on here tonight, Sam and Augie are great guys. You could do, uh, great things if you teamed up with them or found a way to partner. These guys are some of the smartest on the planet. Um, and other, other than that, you can follow me on Twitter 
uh, in the meantime while I'm rebranding GRK at uh, Jonathan Sackett. Fantastic. Yeah, um, I was really excited to hear you taking over over there. It's, uh, it's going to be pretty amazing what you're going to what you're going to do with that brand. Yeah, um, I'm calling on a lot of favors from my uh, my former posses to say, hey, I don't have the budget yet. But, you know, we also have we have over 300 plus locations on the docket that we're in the middle of buying. Oh, so awesome. we're talking by the end of next year to have over 500 locations, uh, be have, control our own Greek aisle in a major grocer. And uh, there's just a lot of great things going on. I'm very tired. I was about to be impressed. I thought you said Greek Isle, I-S-L-E. But I you was going to say island. You're buying an island? Wow. Falling out of control. What kind of CMO pay are you getting over there? You're getting like Hey, guys, I'm not that talented. Pans is back. Okay, let's bring the bottles. Let's get the yachts. Let's go. Hey, and by the way, guys, free free lunches for everybody who's on this show that I'm announcing this because this the deal just went through last week. So this is a just to be a, clear, he's not offering free lunch to the listeners. <laughs> no, but yeah, but no, yeah, you don't, you don't want an FTC probe. And the Bean Car 600 was the last episode after the the promotion that went around. Well, you know what? I'm uh, yeah, I'm offering it to Bob and my posse on this, but I am more than willing to sponsor a show and uh, have a. Uh, some sort of a raffle off or, or something because we've got gold cards for unlimited eating. So, Bob, you and I will work that out, and I'd love to sponsor a show. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. That'd be awesome. As yeah. for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. And, of course, you can find out how to advertise on the program, which uh, Jonathan has just pointed out. So check it all out at thebeancast.com. Com. And now, finally, it's time for this week's Fair, Fail, Foul, a rundown of the best and worst of advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. First up, Sam, Nintendo's Japanese promotion for their, uh, I'm sorry, they should say this is for the fair. <laughs> Nintendo's Japanese pro promotion of their latest Paper Mario game was just really kind of clever. I mean, did you get a chance to watch the video? Yeah, of how I watched it, the video. And using origami nice. to to promote an origami theme to the new game was just awesome. It was just the epitome of um, remarkable creativity. When I was watching this video, I'm thinking, oh, marketing, advertising, communication, there's people out there who get it. So I'm not a gamer, not into Nintendo. I saw this thing, and I just want one, and I want to be part of this world. So it was just a smart on-brand on usage, and uh, hopefully, yeah, you're going to, I'll share it on social, I'm sure you're going to put it with the show notes, but everyone's just got to check out this video, and, you know, from the downer of the earlier parts of this episode, there's just such an ins inspiration to be in, in this type of industry when you see um, glorious works of art like that. Yeah, it's a, like old school thinking on a new school platform. Yeah, yeah I it's loved it. It's awesome. Now, on the fail for the week, uh, fast fashion retailer Shine, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, flagrantly promoted and sold a swastika necklace. Now, I will say that it wasn't the Nazi swastika. It was the Buddhist. Uh, what is it? Um, Buddhist. Yeah, it was the Buddhist. Yeah, Buddhist, Buddhist. The Buddhist and symbol which the Nazis had appropriated, reversed. and it's a reverse swastika from the. And it's not a diamond, you know. So they, they were truly using a Buddhist symbol, but the fact that they didn't have the cultural context and ability to understand that this would somehow be offensive to people is just mind blowing to me. Um, Augie, what's your thoughts? Well, I, I don't have anything to add because, like, you look at it and I, asking, expecting people to have the wherewithal in the initial reaction to seeing a reverse swastika and going, oh, that's the Buddhist symbol. It's just too powerful. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, too I, it's, close, just, man. Yeah. it's such an obvious stumble that yeah. all I can do is shrug. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. And, <laughs> It, they're, obviously, it brought a lot of attention to the company, and they're calling the website for all kinds of other bad taste things that they have, and they're finding lots of them. Yeah, so, there's these Muslim, I think, prayer mats they had as well. So the the, the cultural insensitivity or offensiveness of their stuff, it, it, there's a lots of it. So they have a huge issue to tackle. Now, the foul for the week I'm going to give to Nielsen. Um because they pulled the plug on their out-of-home metrics, which everybody has been talking about, Jonathan. everybody has been talking about it, say, you know, waiting for it. Uh, the networks were all ready to use it in terms of negotiating their upfront deals, which is still going on. Um, they decided to pull the plug on out-of-home metrics until 2021, derailing all these sales pitches. 
And then in a reversal later on the week, they decided not to. And I'm, I'm just like calling in the question, what are they going to put out? If they didn't feel confident that they were going to get it right for 2020 initially, what's going to make it better now and make it effective? Exactly. And, you know, Bob, you know as well as I do, Nielsen has had a lot of problems justifying the statistics that they report. Mm. So I wasn't surprised that this happened. I was surprised on the dating of it that, OK, well, look, the 2020 is a wash. <laughs> well, hold on a second. Where are we going here? They, Nielsen has had historical problems with this and they can never seem to justify nor do the you know, because we've obviously done media buys with them uh, with them in mind. And to, trying to get to the accurate data is challenging because there's so many variables nowadays. So they, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Trust me, if they come up with something in 2021, I'm going to look at it with a skeptical eye. Well, I'm just, just hoping that I, I, I read that and I read their, their sort of, I think they're kind of reading the tea leaves in cancel culture. I think they they were probably competing with Goya this week, and we got away with now talking about Goya on this episode. So I, it's 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 actually quite. Wait until next week. Well, yeah, but it's it's quite. I I kind of saw it as hey, they may be listening to their audience, their consumer, who said hey, we we need this data, and so hopefully folks will work with them and maybe be a bit more patient and empathetic because yeah, they're in a tough spot. So I I just thought mm, again, this is my kind of glass half full, better angel. I'm thinking no, maybe they, they they did it for the right reasons. But the other thing which caught my eye which is probably another show, is that David Kenny is a chief executive officer and he's a chief diversity officer. And and the, the, the backdrop behind that is that he wants to be accountable for, for making it happen. So uh, someone of, like that leading the organization is actually, hmm, I, I'm prepared to actually give them the benefit of the doubt because they're, they're you know, they're, they're holding themselves accountable for screw up. So perhaps this is a CEO and a leader who's actually, uh, you know, going to be on the right side of history. So we shall see. Mm. Time will tell for sure. Well, have a suggestion for this list or just want to discuss it? Comment online. Use the hashtag fair, fail, foul. That's pound, fair, fail, foul. And that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there. Or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then.